last days I wonder if we'll still be faithful Hold me together when I fall apart Would you remind me now of who you are That your love will never change But there's healing in your name That you can take broken things and make them beautiful It took my shame and you walked out Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Let's stand up and get ready to worship this morning. That I 
will be set free. Oh, Jesus, I thank for all that you've done for me. Whoa, oh, 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 Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of his brilliance. The king of glory, the king above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, oh, oh. Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me
Keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of it? can't feel a thing and you say I am strong when I think I am weak and you say I am hell when I have fallen short and when I don't belong oh you say I am lost and I believe oh I believe 
what you say to me I believe Let's just end this moment of of worship and prayer this morning. Lord, we're so thankful that you call us not as we see us, but as you created us to be, that we are made in the image of God. And you looked on that and you said, it is very good. Lord, as we sing this morning, we're singing that we want to, we want to sing this with a renewed vigor with a renewed passion. Let me sing like never before this morning, Lord. Today's a new day. We've never had this day before and we'll never have it again. So Lord, we want to pour back everything into praise this morning. Every failure, every victory, and every moment in between we bring to you. And you paid the price for the shortcomings, the the part of us that we don't want to bring. And Lord, we're so thankful that we get to come into your house this morning and that it's not based on this week's performance that we get to praise and worship. It's not based on next week's performance that we praise and worship. It's based on who you created us to be. Children of God, adopted into the family of the Most High, to be seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This morning, we turn everything back to praise and we honor you and we worship you and we love you this morning. We ask that you'd be with us in the the study of your scriptures this morning as we as we open the Holy Bible. Lord, we pray that you would you would speak by your spirit straight to us, have something in here to to build us up, to encourage us, to to challenge us, that we would go after today like we've gone after no other day before. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can take your seats this morning after. You wave at somebody or smile at somebody.
I got to make some space this morning. The question is, are you excited? It's a good day. It's Sunday. The sun is out. We had a little cleanup day yesterday. Uh, it, was, it was a good day in the sun. The sun won. Um, my nose was rosy red last night. It's a little, little better today. I have a feeling later this week it'll be peeling. Uh, we had some good times, though, and the church is looking, looking fresh. Uh, I don't know if you noticed on the way in this morning. There's a couple bushes over here that were, like, growing over the top of the building, and now they are just brown pieces of wood. So we're praying that they came back. Uh, resurrection can happen. Sometimes some pruning has to happen. Uh, it didn't fit in its space anymore, and before it could be the appropriate size, it had to go through some pain. So uh, you could be praying for our trees as they come back. We, we thought about laying hands on them yesterday, but I was told I already laid too many hands on it. Shouldn't have given me the pruning shears. If you didn't like it, you should have been here. You could have cut them down. <laughs> Oh, it's good. I'm, I'm so glad to see all of your faces this morning. Uh, today we're beginning a new series, but before we get into that, a few announcements. If you did not get a bulletin on your way in, you can always grab one on your way out, or uh, you can interrupt everybody right now, get out of your chair, push people out of the way, and go get one. Or our ushers could bring you one. Uh, so we've got church picnic in two weeks, Sunday two weeks from now, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, we're going to head down to the marina park down there by the, where the totem poles used to stand. Uh, there's the playground down there in the big open field. We'll have some sack lunches ready to go. And we're just going to go down and have some time. Uh, the kids can run around and play. I will also be running around and playing. You can come down and play as well. So it's going to be uh, just a chance to hang out, spend a little extra time getting to know people. Uh, it's going to be fun. June 6th, the following Sunday, is Communion Sunday. Uh, our practice here at Riverview is to observe communion once a month. We do so on the first Sunday of every month. And uh, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit today in, in the message. And then we are going to host a yard sale uh, for the church on Friday, June 11th, and Friday, June 12th. So here's how you can be involved. June 6th, you can bring all of your junk treasures, however you want to label that, uh, to the church, and we'll get it all organized and get it put out, and then, other ways you can be involved, you can help sit with the stuff and haggle with the people and try and get as much money for the church as you can. Uh, seems like a, a worthy competition. Um, after that, uh, you can go and shop yourself and spend all of your money on other people's treasures. It's going to be good. So all of that to say, we are raising money. Uh, we're going to, prayerfully, we are going to re-gravel our parking lot this summer. Uh, it takes, takes some money to do so, but we have some weeds coming through, and we had some, uh, some work on our road done last year, and uh, the equipment kind of did some loops in our parking lot and pushed down a lot of our gravel. So it looks okay right now, but in the winter, uh, when it gets rainy, it turns into a big mud soup out there. So uh, we need to get some new rock. So we're going to take the money from the garage sale and put it towards that project. Uh, so that's how you can be involved in that. It's going to be good. All right. Everybody ready this morning? All right. Let's get into it. We're starting this brand new message series called How to Squander Your Potential. So if you are wondering how you can not live up to uh, the call that is on your life, this will be the perfect message series for you. I'm a pretty positive person, so when I, when I had this, this message series title, I thought, well, that's not very positive, but we're going negative with this one. Uh, I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> if we haven't met yet, my name's Robbie. Uh, I, I pastor here at Riverview, and my wife, who partners with me, is over in the children's classroom today, uh, and it is her birthday, so... You can, you can wish her a happy birthday on the way out, uh, embarrass her, and all that stuff. All right, let's get after this. So we're, we're in this series, How to Squander Your Potential, and we're going to look at King Saul. He's the first king for Israel, and uh, he doesn't quite live up to the potential that we can see in his story. So his story starts off with this, this hope for Israel that he will be a king that will lead them well, and, and there's some things in his, his beginning story that make us think that he will be a good king. He starts off with this humility as, as he's anointed king. He says, who am I? I'm the least of my family, of the least of the clans, of the least of the tribes of Israel. How can I be king? He has this humility about him. And then he goes on and he, he gets this gift of prophecy and, and it seems like God has, uh, God's given him blessing 
and he's told that whatever he puts his hand to, God will be behind him in. It's this hope that we see in this potential that he carries. Uh, so that we're going to look at this, this story of King Saul over the next several weeks, and, and today we're going to kind of give a little bit of background before we get to Saul. Saul's anointed king by the priest, the prophet, Samuel. And Samuel, we talked about his origin story last year at Mother's, or last week at Mother's Day, if you were here, with Hannah. And Hannah goes and she prays uh, that the Lord would, would uh, allow her to have a son, and, and she has this son named Samuel. She dedicates him to the Lord for all of his life. So Samuel grows up in the, the, uh, with, with the other priests, and over time, the other priests that he's serving with are not doing well. Eli's sons who are, are serving are, are taking the choicest meats for themselves. They're dipping into the offering in ways they weren't supposed to. They're taking advantage of the people, and Samuel stands out as a righteous man, as, as a person that is after God's heart. And so he leads the people, and he gains favor with the people, and for his whole life, he, he serves God's people uh, in, as a judge or as a leader. As he gets older, the people come to Samuel and they say, you know, you're not going to be around forever. We need, we need a king. The, the other priests, the other people, we don't see anybody that's, that's good enough to take over for you. Will you give us a king? Like we see in all the countries around us. And so Samuel starts to seek the Lord and the Lord says it's not a good idea to give him a king, but if they demand one, then you're going to give him one. And he's in a town, and he says that the man that comes to you, you're going to anoint him king. And Saul happens to be out looking for his father's donkeys. The donkeys have gone missing. He's sent after them. He travels all around, and he can't find the donkeys. So his servant says, well, there's a man of God staying in this town. We should go seek him and, and ask his advice on where the donkeys are. And if we please him, maybe, just maybe, he will tell us which way the donkeys went. So if you ever lose your donkeys... Just look for a man of God who can tell you where they go. That's my plan anyway. It's a good plan. So they go to the town and uh, they go to find Samuel and, and Samuel ends up anointing Saul king. And he's like, I'm just looking for donkeys. I'm the least. How could you, how could you choose me? And, and Samuel begins to lay out what it looks like. And he says, here's how you know this will be from the Lord. When you go from here, you're going to find other people who are coming to sacrifice and they're going to willingly give you a portion of their sacrifice. As you go on from there, you'll see other prophets coming down from the high place. And, and when you see them, you'll begin to prophesy. And so Saul goes from that place and those things come to pass and Saul's anointed to be the king. There's so much potential here, but with that potential, there's great risk. What would a king mean for the people? Samuel lays out to the people and he says, if you demand a king, here's what that's going to mean. The king is going to take your young men for his army He's going to take your young women for service. He's going to take your best and choicest fields. A portion of all of your harvest is going to go to him. Having a king is not all fun and games. And on top of that, the Lord is your king. You're replacing him. But Samuel gives a little bit of hope in the midst of all that. And uh, he, he he spells out what's going to happen, but he says, if you will follow the Lord still, it could work out okay. So let's see what he says, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12. He says, but when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord, and serve and obey him, and do not rebel against his commands. And if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Should Saul choose to follow God, and the people choose to follow God, and follow Saul as a person that follows God, then good. Everything will continue the way that it is supposed to. But if not, you're in for some trouble. This all starts off with this, this humility and with this blessing. And there's, there's so much potential. Unfortunately, potential doesn't always translate to positive outcome. I'm going to do a little science this morning. A little physics. It's not a Wilson ball. It's mostly worn off. I can't tell what it is. But we've got this basketball. And uh, when we're talking physics, 
up here, this basketball has what we call potential energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed, but this basketball sitting here has energy stored up in it. And if nothing happens to the basketball, it stays there. But if something should make it bounce or roll off, that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. Did I just say that? Potential energy is converted to kinetic or movement. And uh, that energy can be used in a lot of different ways, right? If I shoot a basket, I can score points for my team. If I'm playing in my living room, I can knock over the table that my wife's been working on a puzzle for three days. There's all kinds of potential in that energy. And that potential can even cause a chain reaction. If I was to throw it this way, it would hit this, which would hit that, which would hit that. In fact, I've got a little video this morning of how much potential energy there can be in a basketball. So let's kill the lights. And uh, it's just a short little video here uh, brought to us by the Harlem Globetrotters. And uh, yeah. And that is way more skill than I have. Uh, that was made by Georgia Tech with the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, they call that the Rube Goldberg uh, type thing, where one thing causes another and causes another. And so we're going to talk about our potential today and how we get the most out of our potential. Uh, and we're going we're to look at Saul's story. Saul's story does not go well, but there is much that we can learn from it. So we're going to get into it. Um, we're going to kind of parallel this with Psalm 23, and we're going to read that, that psalm in its entirety this morning, all six verses of it. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This psalm is where our potential is supposed to lead us to. We're all filled with potential, and we have this potential to, to create, potential to destroy, to build people up, to tear people down to partner with God intending the portion of creation that, that we're given charge over, or to do things our own way and push back and do what's right in our own eyes. And Saul's story starts off with this promise that, that he could be a good king for Israel. But if you read his story, he gives into fear and, and pride and jealousy and a lack of faith. And the question that I want to ask this morning is, how did somebody who started off so well get to be this mean, vindictive, jealous king. Right? He didn't wake up one morning and think, I'm just going to go do things my own way. So what went wrong in this story with Saul? And, and can we learn from those, this, those historical concepts, those biblical concepts, and combat those same factors in our own lives? So if you're following along in your notes this morning, if you want to fill in some blanks, uh, you can do so. 
Number one, don't let fear replace faith. Don't let fear replace faith. Our family has this tradition that we do every year on October 31st, on Halloween morning, we head to the Oregon Zoo. And that's been our, our tradition for uh, six years now. And we do it every, every year, and we always dress up in fun, fun little costumes, usually Disney characters. Uh, and, and so we go to the Oregon Zoo, and we get there first thing in the morning, right when the gate opens, because that's when the animals are out and they haven't been pestered all day. And so we get there, and uh, it's so fun. And so my, one year... Uh, when Kinley, my, my oldest daughter, was just a little over a year old, she was barely walking, uh, we had the strollers and we got in there and we got down to where the lions are. And the lions were, were out that morning and they just brought in, or just had, uh, these, these lion cubs. And so there was, I think, three or maybe four of these lion cubs that were uh, just slightly larger than a dog running around in there. And we get down to the, the big plexiglass wall, or whatever kind of glass that is, the big glass wall, and we're sitting there watching these lions, and the cubs are just playing, running around, and one of the cubs comes right up to the glass. And so he's standing, you know, maybe 10, 12 inches from us, right on the other side of this glass. And so we put Kinley down there, and so she's barely standing, and there's this baby lion on the other side, and the lion starts licking the glass. And so Kinley puts up her hand. We were working on high fives and fist bumps, so Kinley puts her hand on the glass, and the lion gives her a high five through the glass. And so we're laughing. This is hilarious. And Kinley would kind of toddle along the edge of the glass and the lion would follow her. Other people came and went and the lion was just obsessed with, with Kinley. And it was super cool. It was memorable. We got pictures. We got videos. Uh, and it's this, this situation that we always think about when we go back to the zoo. Remember that time when the lion was just playing with Kinley? But here's the thing. The reality of this situation is if that glass wasn't there, we'd have a completely different story. Lions are terrifying, but because there's this glass, there's, there's no fear. If we remove the glass from the equation, this fun, exciting experience becomes terrifying. The lion doesn't just want to play high five, he wants breakfast. Our, our brains are amazing when it comes to fear. In fact, there's a, there's a chemical reaction that takes place when we see something that, that causes fear. There's this part of our brain called the amygdala, and it's uh, a part of the brain that activates when we see a, a threat stimulus. It prompts the body to have a physical response, right? The brain becomes hyper alert, and, and our pupils dilate, and the bronchi dilate, and uh, all, all of our organs kick into gear, and the ones that aren't essential slow down, like our gastrointestinal system, so that uh, more resources can be devoted to surviving whatever is coming at us. But there's another part of our brain called the hippocampus that is also working to interpret the threat. And this is the part of the brain that says, okay, there's a lion there, that's scary, but there's glass there, so you don't have to be afraid, you can give high fives. It's the part that's interpreting what's going on and it tempers our fear. Our faith is supposed to do the same thing when it comes to fear. It's supposed to be the glass between us and what happens. It's, it's this instinctive thing. We don't have to think that there's glass there and realize it, our brain just does it. Faith is supposed to do the same thing and rein in our responses with the knowledge that, that God is in control. So when Samuel tells Saul that he would be king and that there's going to be these signs to expect in the coming days, he ends it by giving some instructions on the timeline of how this is going to happen. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 7, Samuel's talking to Saul, and he says, Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. So as Saul steps into this role of king, He's anointed, he's, he's declared king. There are some people in the land that aren't sure that Saul's up for the job. The Philistines are pressing against the Israelites and they need a king that is going to lead them in this, in this fight. And they're, they're not sure that Saul's up to the challenge. Things begin to heat up with the Philistines and, and Saul has this opportunity to, to lead the people, to prove himself. But the question is, what does he do with this potential? In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 5, we're going to spend the rest of the most of this in, in 1 Samuel chapter 13. It says, The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets 
among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Saul's motivated by, by fear, and he panics when he sees that his people are deserting, and he doesn't see Samuel coming. He's driven by the circumstances around him instead of his faith in God who has said, whatever you put your hands to, I will be with you. His fear overcomes his faith. And so he has this moment where he takes things into his own hand and into his own power to try and overcome this situation. Number two, we learn from Saul that rituals without relationship produces little of value. So this week I spent up some time looking up sports rituals, and it's, it's come to my attention that athletes do some weird stuff uh, to try to make themselves play better in the name of ritual and, and superstition. So I thought I'd, I'd share some of the standouts with you. Um, there's literally hundreds out there, but these are some of my, my favorites. And you can try these out in case one of your sports ball fans, uh, players that you root for is in a slump. You can try these out for them. Uh, the first one, you can clip your fingernails right before the game. That way you can't bite them. Uh, you can wear five pairs of socks. Apparently that helps. Four will not help. has to be five. Uh, but if you put on five pairs of socks, I hear that helps. You can wear your opponent's shorts to bed the night before. Wear them as pajamas. Uh, that can get a little expensive. It can be rather difficult to always find a pair of shorts for the opposing team. But if you've got managers and teammates helping you out, shouldn't be a problem. Uh, you can work it out that way. You can eat a bucket of chicken before every game. That's a good one. Chicken. Side note, I've been a vegetarian for like three months now. My, my wife is pregnant with our third child, and uh, we can't cook meat in the house. So I have not, I get to do prime time on Thursdays. Uh, that's our group for, for 50 and up. Uh, for those that are interested, 11 o'clock on Thursdays, a little plug there. Uh, we, we have worship and a lesson, and then we do a potluck after, and there's always meat. Uh, it's the real reason why we're hosting that whole event every week, is so I can get some meat. It's good. All right, next one. When all else fails, don't shave. I hear this mostly works for guys for their beards. I don't know if it works for the ladies. Uh, I'll let you figure that one out, but uh, if you don't shave your beard, it helps your team. So those are the, the rituals and superstitions that I found that I, I thought were, were solid, right? Those, those will help your team win. And uh, there's those that swear by these superstitions. If, if they don't bounce the ball three times before they shoot, they only bounce it twice and they miss, it's because they didn't do things quite right. And Saul's playing this same game. The people begin to desert. The enemy looks overwhelming. They're in the thousands. He's only got 3,000 troops with him. It says that he's got 3,000 with him. And the other people, they've got 3,000 of this type of warrior. They've got 6,000 of that type of warrior. And then they've got all the foot soldiers that they could possibly want, as many as the sands on the seashore. And here's Saul looking on, terrified. Which, without the glass, the lion looks terrifying. Saul's without his glass. And so he starts to play the game. Well, what have our people done in the past that have led to these enormous victories, these victories that seem out of reach? Well, we've, we've offered sacrifices. And that's gotten the Lord to fight for us, and he's gone before us and, and done it. And so he goes after this ritual. If we make the sacrifice, the Lord will be with us. And he's like, oh, that'll encourage the people. And, and so he hits up this pregame ritual. And, and what, he, what he fails to realize, though, is that it wasn't the act itself that secured God's favor. It was the relationship that that act symbolized. So let's go on in our story, verse 10. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. 
but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. By not following the Lord's command, Saul shows that, that his focus wasn't on his faith, but on his fear and on his ability to overcome the obstacle in front of him. He displays a knowledge of God without real faith in him. And I, I think we, we can apply this same principle to us today. While we don't do burnt offerings and we're not facing uh, thousands of Philistines on the opposing hillside, uh, we, can, we can get in the same danger of replacing relationship with ritual. Let's take communion, for example. That's a, that's a ritual that we do every month. And, and for us, it's, it's something that, that we do because Jesus commanded us to do so. Our practice is to do that the first Sunday of every month. We take communion. And this act separate from the heart of God, it becomes stale, it becomes crusty, it becomes just an act of religion. Outside of Christ, it's even a little creepy. This is the body of your God broken for you. Eat this. Here's a cup of juice. It's red. It looks like blood. It symbolizes his blood. Drink this. Seems a little creepy outside of Christ. I remember the first time I took communion, I was like, wait, what are we doing? I didn't grow up in church, so I, I, the first time I took communion, I was probably 16 years old, and I was at church with Carissa. We were dating at the time, and they said, here's, here's some cracker, and here's some blood, and, and they started to go through, and they didn't explain it super well, and I thought, this is rather odd. This is a weird ritual, and apart from relationship, it is weird. But inside of relationship, it has this potential to open us up to, to life-giving relationship, to faith-filling relationship. It's, it's an opportunity for us to remember that the cross was enough, that our sin was paid for, that all those parts of us that we don't know how to reconcile are reconciled in Christ. And it's just an awesome opportunity to do that. And Jesus says, do this often because we need to remember that. The same can be said of other rituals in our life. Are there any areas in your life where you see the same thing, where ritual has replaced relationship? Well, I tithe, I give to the Lord, therefore I should see financial blessing. Or I pray, therefore I should be insulated from the hard parts of life. God, God, I'm, I, he's for me, he's with me, I don't have to face the bad stuff. Or I know the worship songs by heart, I should feel more in worship. Those are instances where I think we can replace relationship with ritual. The good news is that it's never too late to turn those things around and to head in the other direction toward relationship. I give because I love God and because he has poured out blessing after blessing on my life. I pray not to get God on my side, on my terms, but to get on his level. I, the, the, the joy of worship isn't that, that I know the words really well or that I can sing beautifully because I can't or I can play the guitar awesome because I can't. The awesome part of worship is that we get to make a joyful noise and come into the presence of the Lord. We can always turn ritual back toward relationship. And Samuel gives this proclamation that things aren't going to go in Saul's direction. But I, I believe with everything in me that if Saul had repented right there, if he had changed direction, if he had changed his heart, things could have turned around. But it's hardened Saul's heart. And he continues to get more and more prideful, more and more arrogant, more and more jealous and angry and bitter. Brings us to number three. Patience is hard when the time is short. Patience is hard when the time is short. A few years ago, uh, Carissa and I were running a business, and it was an escape room. Has anybody ever done an escape room? A few? Oh, about half of you. Awesome. Escape rooms are fun. So basically, the premise is you go into this themed room where there are a bunch of puzzles that you have to solve to accomplish a mission, and you have a time limit. So you work together with your team to solve everything in the room, and uh, think of like national treasure, right? You solve one thing, which leads to the next, which leads to the next. And so we had these, these rooms that we had set up, and one of them was a Camelot-themed room. And in the room, it was, a, it was a throne room. There was the round table in the middle, and there's all these props around the room. And as you solve puzzles, you come closer and closer to finding the Sword of Excalibur. And you had one hour. Uh, the storyline was that the, the enemy armies were approaching the gates, and you had one hour before they were going to break into the castle. But if you and your team come up with Excalibur, uh, you, you get to escape. 
And so it was this, this fun, one-hour-long thing. And so teams would come in, and they'd start off, you know, one or two people might be really excited. We had teams of two up to eight people, and uh, people would get, get into it. But then there was always, you know, the one who would stand against the wall and just kind of watch. Uh, they were there just to be with their friends or, uh, you know, oh, I'm not really great at puzzles, so you guys just do your thing. But then as time goes on, people get more and more excited. People get sucked in. And when it comes down to two minutes, there was never, the person that was sitting against the wall never didn't get into it. Like in those last two minutes, everybody's frantically trying to solve the last of these puzzles. And as a, as, as a result of this, this increased tension and anxiety, as time got shorter and shorter, communication would start to break down. Teams that had worked well together up to this point are now no longer trusting that the other person has any ability whatsoever. Uh, just give me that, I'll do it. Uh, pushing and pulling starts to happen. Um, usually I was in the room with the teams helping guide and lead, and they'd start yelling at me, just let us know what we're supposed to do. So much anxiety. And the less time that they had, the more they tried to hold on to what they were doing, right? If they were, if they were trying to solve a puzzle, in the beginning, they'd think about it logically. They'd go step by step. But when time got short, all those things went out the window, and it was just grind, 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 get it done, get it done, get it done. And the thing is, when we run low on a resource, we try desperately to hold on to what we have left, whether that's time or money or emotional energy. Maybe you feel like maybe you don't have enough personality to fit in. We hold on to the little resource that we have left. And we see that with, with Saul. He had his 3,000 troops. People are deserting and in verse 15, it says, Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah and Benjamin, and Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 600. So he's looking at this army against him, and he's now down to 600. So he gets anxious, and he starts to make the sacrifice, and he takes things into his own hand. He tries to hold on to the little resource that he has left. What he should have been remembering is the story of Gideon where God took 30,000 soldiers and said, too many. So he went down to 10,000 soldiers, and God said, too many. And he took them down to 300 soldiers, and they went and they took out and wiped out the entire army, and they didn't even have to fight. He should have been remembering Jericho, where they marched around the walls, and all they had to do was walk, and the walls tipped in. He should have been remembering all of these things that the Lord had done in such a miraculous way. But he looks at his 600, and he freaks out. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough resource. Here's doing things my way. He should have chosen faith over fear, relationship over ritual, trusting God's ability to win when the resources are seemingly small. Unfortunately, the potential for good doesn't always translate or convert into positive outcome. And in Saul's heart, God doesn't see somebody that's going to turn back to him or to turn after the heart of God. And so he says, I'm going to go after a man, after my own heart. So back to our Psalm 23, it talks about the cup running over. Saul's cup is, is hardly running over at this point. Let's read the, the last two verses of that Psalm once again. Psalm 23, verse 5 says, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a, uh, an exercise that oftentimes elementary school teachers will do with their kids. They tell them, imagine you have a bucket on top of your head, right? And what you do to the other people will either fill up their bucket or take from their bucket. And so think about your actions. Think about how you're uh, reacting with all of these other people. So this morning, I want to I wanna imagine that we all have a bucket on top of our head, and the bucket this morning represents your level of satisfaction in life today. How full is your bucket? Would you call it overflowing? Does it feel empty? Does it feel like you keep pouring into it and it's just got holes in the bottom? Never, never seems to even get close to full. The psalmist paints a picture of a person that is sitting at a prepared table, enemies all around, and he's just sitting there eating his bucket of chicken. He's fully protected, fully anointed. The cup is running over. Jesus uses a picture similar to this 
when he's talking to the woman at the well and he says, if you, if you knew who I was, you would ask and I would give you living water, a, a stream that would never run out. Sounds to me like a cup that's running over. So I want to look at this morning, uh, how do we go about filling up our cup? How can our cup become full? Because when our cup is full, we're less likely to squander our potential. If our cup is full, we're less likely to do the Saul side of things. So let's talk about how we fill up our cup. Number one, we recognize that he holds all of the resources. God's the one who prepares the table. And he does it with, with his resources. And then he gives us the opportunity to come and fill up. The gold and the silver are his. They're his resources. He has heavenly storehouses filled up. I was talking with somebody years ago who uh, was without a job. And he was an incredibly successful person, the head of this, had a great degree, had great business uh, acumen, and he found himself without a job. And he went on interview after interview, and, and it just wasn't working out. And his family started to get down on him. His extended family started to say, you know, you've got all this experience. You've got the degree. Why, why can't you land a job? That's a hard thing to hear. But his response stuck with me, and it's, it's something that I think will stick with me my entire life. He said, what if I have every single dollar that God wants me to have right now? I thought, that's pretty powerful. What if I had every dollar that God wants me to have right now? God prepares the table. He holds all the resources. And that's a hard thing to say when we don't have many resources, and we want to cling to them, and we want to say, I've only got two nickels to run, rub together. But our cup will never be full when we cling to what we think is ours. Number two, we have to recognize that protection is in place. The trouble isn't banished. The enemies aren't cast out. They're still there, but there's glass. The lions are circling, but there's glass. The difficulties will always be present. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. That is a promise from our Messiah and our Savior. Thank you for that one, Jesus. Thank you that I will always have trouble. But he says, there's glass. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Number three, we recognize a full, clap, full cup splashes on those nearby. An overflowing cup is going to affect those around you. When we feast with the trust of protection, goodness, and love are what come out of us, come out of our cup. Our potential converts to peace. Have you ever had those moments in life where, where your world is shaking, where you don't know which way is up and you're just, you're frustrated, you just want to yell and scream, you can't sit still, and you come into the presence of somebody that just exudes peace. And they're just, they're there for you, they hear every word you're saying, and when you come away from them, you yourself are more at peace. Those people are a treasure and uh, we need to hold on to those people tightly, but God says he is that for us. Jesus himself is our peace. We're drawn to that stability and that, and that, that mannerism that can just settle the waters. And when we have that, it comes out of us. When we spend time with Jesus in those earth-shattering moments, when it seems like the lions are coming right through the glass, our cup can begin to fill up. Number four, we have to trust the promise. We have to trust the promise. Right, it says, surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the promise. We get to dwell in the house forever. No matter what happens, his peace and goodness follow us. In Romans 15, 13, it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you. That's a good name for God. God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace so that you can overflow hope to those around you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Number five, self-assessment time. How is, is your cup? Is it full? Is it empty? Is it feel like it's just way too big and it's just gonna take way too much to fill up this giant cup? What drains your cup? What is it that, that, that takes this, this fullness feeling away from you? And I think this is probably more than just a one-minute thought for Sunday morning. 
I think that takes time for us to, to sit in prayer and, and meditation and, and ask ourselves, what is it that, that takes from my, my faith? What takes away my walk? What makes me feel anxious and angry and frustrated? What makes me feel like I need to make the sacrifice right now because I don't have enough? What is it that drains your cup? And then on the flip side of that, what are the things that fill your cup? What would it take for your cup to, to be filled to where it can overflow, to where peace and joy and goodness not only follow you but pour out of you regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the lions, regardless of, of whatever it is that you're facing? Psalm 23 is supposed to be what our potential takes us toward. You lead me to green pastures. You make me lie down. You fill me up with rest. Your oil pours on me and you, you guide me and you lead me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Though the enemies circle, I'm at the table. Though things aren't going my way, though the bank account's empty, though the, the health report isn't the best, though the job loss may be there, though the whatever it may be, yet I hold on to the promise. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely your goodness will follow me all of my days. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for your green pastures. We thank you for the feast that you prepare before us. Lord, help us to not take things into our own hands. Help us to not turn things to ritual without relationship. God, we choose faith this morning. Lord, build up our glass that when the fearful thing comes, we wouldn't even have to think about the fact that the glass is there and we can high-five the lion. If you're here this morning and you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, that's where the whole cup filling starts. Without relationship with the one that can fill the cup, we'll do things to try to fill it ourselves. And as we do that, we'll find that even if we can get the, the level up a little bit, it's, it's never going to stay full. So if you're here today and you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, with every eye closed and every head bowed, would you slip up a hand just saying, yeah, that's me. I want to start this walk today. I want to give everybody an opportunity to, to start this thing because I think it's the best choice that we can make. whether you're here in person or you're watching online, if you want to pray that prayer along with me, this is what that looks like. And I think we can't pray this prayer too many times. Even as a believer who's believed since you were a kid, this prayer always brings us back to ground zero. Lord, I've taken things into my own hands. I've gone the Saul way of things when I didn't see you show up in the way that I thought you'd show up, I did the sacrifice myself. I've held on to things too tightly. I've made the wrong choices. I've gone the wrong way. But I believe that the cross paid for all of that, that Jesus is my peace, and that in him my cup can overflow. That relationship with you above any ritual is worth more than any gold I could find. And I commit to walking with you. I commit to learning what it means to be a person after your heart. I want to know what you have for me. I want to know your way. prayed that prayer this morning it's the best choice that we could ever make it's the only way to full cup Jesus says if we abide in him he will abide in us when we give our heart to Christ it says that the Holy Spirit comes and marks us that we're filled up Lord we're so thankful that you fill us up daily. Lord, fill us today that we would have the strength to go tomorrow, that when the lions begin to come, we can high-five the lion. 
Lord, give us faith, faith over fear. God, we honor you with our time this morning. We honor you with our thought this morning. We honor you with our study this morning. And we pray that you would draw some of these truths back to us throughout the week. Lord, speak to us the thing that you need us to hear today. God, we love you and we honor you with all of this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to end today with one more song of worship. And as we do so, our ushers are going to come with the trays and take the morning offering. Uh, you can also give online if that's your preferred method uh, or mail it, at, mail it into the P.O. box. Uh, those, those options are in the bulletin as well if those are your preferred methods. Uh, but if you'd like to give during, during worship this morning, we are going to make that opportunity available. Pray a quick blessing over the offering. Lord, we thank you so much. And we just give back to you what, what you've blessed us with. We thank you that you, you're always looking out for us. And we pray that you would do much with this offering in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
week ahead of us is a basketball filled with potential. The question is, what do we do with the potential? As we go from here today and we think about everything that's coming up, there are some things we know that are going to be a part of this week, part of your schedule. There's unknown things, the things that pop up and wreck our schedule. For some of us, that's the most terrifying thing in the world. Think about how you can fill up your cup this week. And remember that it's not all up to you. It's a partnership with God. It's a relationship with him. And that's what fills up the cup and makes the, the potential go the way that it's supposed to go. Let's pray a prayer of dismissal today. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray for this week that you would open our eyes to the things that you have for us, those opportunities to grow and learn, opportunities to love and serve, opportunities to come closer to your heart. Lord, help us to capitalize on the stored up potential that this week has. God, we love you so much. We love you so much. Teach us how to love deeper, how to love more. We ask all this in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great week, church. Feel free to stick around, hang around, talk with some people, and we'll see you all next week.